Glory be to Christ, our only hope, the only one that could ever do it for us. So, amen. So, this morning, brothers and sisters, I'm going to start, before I read the word, I'm going to start with an apology, because the more I went through this text, the more, since the pastor started bringing this text to us, the more angry I became, and I want to apologize for that, because there is a peculiarity about this text in the sense that false teachers are such a horrendous enemy and since they've thrust themselves forth to lead, they have put themselves under the judgment of God. They themselves have placed themselves there and in doing so, righteous anger wells up. So if I become a little... I don't know what the word would be, but just hear me on that, please. So to get started, let me read the word that we've been looking at for the past few weeks and have the privilege of telling you more about it. So brothers and sisters, I ask that you please stand for the reading of God's word. But there are also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in the chains of darkness to be held for judgment, and if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, and if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was dis distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless. For that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desires of the flesh and despise authority. Bold and arrogant, they're not afraid to heap abuse on celestial beings. Yet even angels, although they are stronger and more powerful, don't heap abuse on such beings when bringing judgment on them from the Lord. But these people blaspheme in matters they don't understand. They're like unreasoning animals, creatures of instinct, born only to be caught and destroyed. And like animals, they too will perish. They will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. Their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight. They are blots and blemishes, reveling with pleasures while they feast with you. While eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They are experts in greed and a cursed brood. They have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of wickedness. But he was rebuked for his wrongdoing by a donkey, an animal without speech, who spoke with a man's voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These people are springs without water and mists driven by a storm. 
Blackest darkness is reserved for them, for they mouth empty, boastful words, and by appealing to the lustful desires of the flesh, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, while they themselves are slaves of depravity. For people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. If they have escaped the corruption of this world by knowing our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and are again entangled in it and overcome, they are worse off in the end than they were in the beginning. It would have been better for them to have not known the way of righteousness than to have known it and turned their backs on its sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them the Proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit, and a sow that is washed returns to her wallowing in the mud. May God bless the reading of his word to your soul. You may be seated. So brothers and sisters, this is a timely word as all of God's word is, but this is a peculiarly timely word because we live in the age of apostasy. We live in the age of trial. We live in the age of error. And if this were just a text that were set apart in one small corner of the scripture, we may not give so much great attention in the past few weeks like we have. But I ran out of paper looking for the amount of places where the Bible says clearly to watch out for false teachers, to watch out for false prophets. These are vain imaginers. These are people who do not live in the fear of God. And that, dear friends, is the difference. You see, peculiarly, as I got here early uh, with Pastor and Dan, and we were talking and praying, yeah, I, I came across a stone, sort of like Paul did. And this stone says something here. It says, if man could merit his own salvation, Christ would never have died to provide it. That, my dear friends, is probably one of the most wicked lies taught by a false teacher. That's true. Don't hear what I said wrong. The opposite of that. That somehow you've added to your salvation. Somehow you've done something. The answer is never can it be. Christ crucified for sinners is the heart and root of the gospel that we never move away from. This is the heart of our salvation. And the truth of that is received by the grace of God when He opens our ears, opens our eyes to that truth, and causes us to be born again, to be born of God, to be born with the affections, love, mercy, glory, goodness that our souls craving to see, know, and understand, driving us into peaceful living, if you will, and causing us to reject this world. Not a slight change of life, not a slight improvement, an absolute killing of your person. You were born in sin, you acted out sin, you've lived out your sin, until the gospel came, you thought your sin was okay, and even still to this day, there is sin that is unrepented of, unregenerate in your life, that you still hold on to. Which makes you a false teacher. The greatest false teacher to be aware of is yourself. Because you will self-justify. You will absolutely claim your righteousness as goodness even when it's disagreement with the Word of God. See, that's the dividing line. It is the Word of God. It's the revealed truth of God. And when we get into the text, you'll see how the false teachers go against the Word of God. But the first warning this morning is to not listen to yourself. The first warning is that you will justify, satisfy, pacify any sort of anything to make, you, make yourself feel better. Self-love, 
is what the world would talk about, and we drink this in like poison arrows. We listen to the folly of this world, and until some point comes and we are broken out from the truth of the world on the subject. So let me just set that for an example. When you were caused to be born of God, you had known a set, a picture, a perspective, a sin in your life, even if it's one. And God caused you to feel guilt and shame over it and turn toward Him as the only satisfaction, as the only one who can bring peace to your soul. But you were not, you were completely born of God and regenerate. The problem is that that is God's work. When it comes to the work that we must do, we search our souls. We look carefully. We plead with God that He would allow us to see ourselves as He sees us. We plead with God that He allow us to see what was written in the book of life today about us. That we would see it the way He does. Because until the greater manifestation of understanding that we are vile to the core. I mean, if you were to put a, and I've heard someone else say it this way, put a little chip in your brain and then take it out and then play it for everyone to see on this screen this morning, how would you do? You tremble in fear of the things you thought. You tremble in fear of, of the things that you've said. And that's the true picture. And those are the elements of what God is calling us to reform in our life. Not in our willpower, but by the spirit and power of God. To trust Him totally to do so. Now, the subject this morning is false teachers. And that glory of the mercy of the truth of God that I just explained to you, they hate. The false teacher wants you to follow them and not Jesus Christ. The false teacher wants you to follow their depraved conduct, not Jesus Christ. The false teacher wants you to give them your money so that they can live like the world. I listened to Jesse Duplantis. I, what I did for a study on this would break your heart. He stood before a congregation of people and bragged about his 40,000 square foot mansion. What a fool. What a, what, a, what a pathetic example as a representative of Jesus Christ, though he claims that he is not. He is a false teacher under the condemnation and wrath of God. For he is exactly what Peter's talking about. And if we say, well, no, you know, no. no, he is a false teacher. And so is Joel Olstein and Furtick and Hinn and Moore and Meyer and Warren and any UCC pastor around here. I drove here this morning and had a tear in my eye. I drove past the church that's going to blast animals. They're going to call people together in the house of God to bless animals. Talk about being so far from the gospel and knowing any sort of truth. It's crazy. The ECLA with their rainbow flags on the front of church. I saw another sign on the front of a church that said, Jesus wasn't a Christian. It's crazy. We, we live in a time where this is everywhere around us. I would say most mainline denominations have bastardized the gospel. I would say every pope is an antichrist. Bill Johnson, anything to do with Bethel. Amy Grant, Lord Daigle, Chris Tomlin. Musical influences that are saying things in your ear that are not true. John tells us, we must be so careful to what we let into our hearts, to what we let into our ears, because you will run them up. Now, if you are listening to worldly music, I get it. I'm not saying I don't. But boy, oh boy, I would encourage you to be so careful. 
Oh, be careful, children of God, because your ears are so sensitive, you will, unbeknownst to you, be bringing into some idea of sin that you will think is okay. Be careful. Todd White, the false teacher, Andy Stanley, Mike Bickle, Francis Chan, Tony Evans, John Haggy, Tim Keller, Kat Keir, Greg Laurie, Max Licato, Joseph Prince, Jackie Hill Perry, Sid Roth, Ann Voskamp, Rob Bell, and hundreds of others that claim to know God have stood in His pulpit to preach His gospel and have compromised His word. These are enemies of God. I pray that God saves their soul one day. I do. They have thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of followers, and we plead with God Almighty for our 20. We plead with God for people that have been truly born of God, that I know will stand in heaven with me, that I can look forward to on the day of judgment because their hearts have followed the way of truth. Oh, we're not perfect. No, no claim there at all. But they're teaching things that we know are not true. Many teach that Jesus isn't the only way to God. That many paths lead to God. That is, the, that is a horrible lie. And that's taught in many congregational churches. Has anyone ever visited a UCC church? You know they don't even open the Bible on Sunday morning? They can preach to you from Shakespeare or the Quran, and they call themselves a church? This is madness. Some teach that Jesus was created by God. Mormons and such. Millions of people. Jesus is an uncreated being. He is God Himself. God Almighty. Some teach that Jesus is not God. Some teach that the Holy Spirit is a force. They are God-haters to the max. I hate to say it. We can look at other groups of people who gather together very powerfully under their banners and work together in unity way better than we do. And it shames me to say that out loud. But they're working as a force. If you've ever seen the, the Pentecostal Holy Spirit chant, it, it's almost, it, I, I, the first time I saw it, that was a joke. Before they do something, they, 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 they rah, rah, cheer, chant the force of the Spirit to do even folly through them. It, it's it's mind-boggling to watch. And I think one of the most wicked things that's taught in every compromised church on earth is this, that man is not sinful by choice and by nature. Those two, that thought right there, means that somehow I'm not owed my judgment. Somehow, as I watch Joel Olstein say, man's not really bad. 99, what do you say? 99.8% of people aren't bad. This is a man who's absolutely unfamiliar with his sin. This is a person, and the people that follow and believe that have never been acquainted with their sin, never understood the need for a Savior. See, that's the mercy of God. When your eyes have been opened to the truth that your Creator is your judge, and that only He Himself can satisfy the necessary judgment, that's when that cross right there becomes full of grace. Amazing grace that He would do such a merciful thing for sinners like us. It's 
So that's the pretext to the false teachers. Now this book is really awesome. It, 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 it's a short book and praise be to God we're going through it. So we understand by this book that it starts out with God's calling and election. When you are elect of God, the truths that come from His Word and the truths that come from His pulpit, your heart rejoices. And though it's tough, Though your conscience and your spirit is wounded when you are called out as a sinner to repent, to turn from your ways, to change from your lying and your cheating, from your slothful ways that we are all guilty of, the gospel then comes and mends your wound that your soul is now satisfied in Christ alone so that your ears are now more attentive to his truth and we can understand it so elect of God this is what this this is who this letters to it's to God's children to the elect of God he says number one confirm that election by the way you live we heard that a bunch of weeks ago add to your knowledge perseverance that whole laddering effect and the high Holy calling for you, brothers and sisters, is to live a life of love. Be very, very clear on it. It starts with your love toward God. It then goes love to your spouse. It then goes love to your children. It then goes love to your church. And then it goes love out into the world. You will never be able to love the world if you skip over those steps. When the world kicks your teeth and or spits in your face. You'll then raise up in your ungodly flesh and respond that way. But until God is all in all and developing, growing, encouraging, and strengthening us to then face this world in His power, with His armor to accomplish great and glorious things, putting aside our battles, our sullenness, our brokenness, our anger, our, all of those things to walk forward in faith and leaving that behind, as the Bible would say. And you do that through the work of God, through faith, goodness, <clears throat> knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly love, love. This is how it goes. This is your confirming and calling of your elect state before God for the mature Christian. We then understand from the text that Scripture is fully prophetic, fully true, revealed from God to man to guide your life. Then chapter 2 comes in to say, now watch out. That's the pure word of truth. It's guarded by the Holy Spirit, which who, who himself will confirm it in your soul. And the Bible is replete with these warnings. Jesus, Peter, Paul, John, all through Scripture, Old Testament, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, every major, it's everywhere in the Bible. Watch your life and doctrine closely. The world hates doctrine. The church has begun to hate doctrine. We love it here. We love it. In fact, the part of the doctrine is, is in the thing right there. Chapter 31, paragraph 31.1. Talks about the judgment. Talks about what's going to happen to false teachers. We love that doctrine. And we've talked about doctrine for a long time. And I hope your soul is encouraged and strengthened because doctrine is knowledge through instruction about the truth of the Word of God. Simple. Helping. Encouraging. Guiding. Protecting. That's what doctrine does. It allows us to say, yeah, if you're flopping around on the floor speaking gibberish, you are a disgrace to God Almighty. It's nonsense. So let's deal with the text. But there will also be false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. This is a warning par excellence, you are to watch. So we use, let's set a standard here also. What is prophecy in a New Testament church? Is it new revelation from God? 
absolutely not, never can it be. This word is complete. John says very clearly in the Revelation, if anyone adds to it or takes it away, may the curses announced by God Almighty destroy them. So we are not adding anything new. So how do we deal with this word prophecy? The word prophecy is when somebody stands in this pulpit to open the word of God for deeper meaning and clarity, prophetically understanding, pulling together the pieces of God's word, and as Nehemiah would say, to make it clear to those who are listening. That is what prophecy is. So we don't reject the idea of prophecy, but we recognize it in this context of false prophets and people that stand in a pulpit. Those, there will be false prophets among you. This is not a maybe, it's not a, it is true. This is a warning to us. And there will be false teachers on the radio, on the TV. By the way, let's, <clears throat> if you think for one second that anyone could be pastored on TV or on a radio, you're a fool. That is absolutely an, an, an apostasy to the church of Jesus Christ. Where men and women come together in the spirit of unity, the bond of peace, to worship God, to be in each other's lives. To sit behind a radio or TV is nonsense. That is not pastoring. There is no, you do not have a pastor there at all. You might have someone that you like listening to and it's helpful. They are not your pastor. You don't even know discernment-wise if doctrinally we agree. Because, as an example... You need to know doctrinally the difference between a Presbyterian. R.C. Sproul. Anyone like R.C. Sproul as a teacher? I do. Amen. Dear brother in the Lord, we love our Presbyterian, rock solid, rock rib Presbyterian. But they're different. And they're going to answer theological problems differently. So you've got to be careful with that. I'm not saying he's wrong. I would say that we, have a, we can disagree on tertiary issues. Totally cool. We disagree on the mode of baptism. We disagree on uh, just some minor points, right? It, it, it's, it's not the way you are baptized, sprinkled or dipped, is not going to affect your salvation. However, we will battle in this church because we believe that Romans six is clear. It's immersion as a picture and testimony of going into the grave with Jesus Christ, as Romans six says, and being raised to. New life. The church of new life. Raised to life in Jesus Christ. That's why we battle for that baptism picture. We don't, they're not heretics. They're our brothers. Okay? There are false teachers out there. This is the warning. And what these false teachers do, they're, they're heretics. They're enemies of God. They're going to claim God doesn't know everything, and then they know certain things. That's one of the big claims of many of these teachers. They don't say, thus saith the Lord. It's, thus saith me, because I want your money. Thus saith me, because I want to live like a pig, and I want you to be okay with it too, so you don't call me out. The responsibility in this church... Nowhere else in this church. And I pray one day someone doesn't know it's not yet. Big pastor has. That in my way. But things people would say to me, tell me, you know what? Mm, you know what the word of God says on that? Maybe we're a little too on that, and then maybe we can talk about it. I pray that we all get to this point in the unity of being able to speak this truth into our lives. And, and when you instruct the wise man, they become wiser still, as the Bible says. And we would grow. We would flourish in this way. But the false teacher is going to secretly introduce destructive heresies. One of the most destructive heresy right now is something called open theism. Forget the name. These are people that are the free willers of the world. Meaning, we've got free will. You ever hear these arguments about that? Like, God's not sovereign. We believe 
So, so this is no surprise. I don't think this is a surprise to anybody at all. We believe that God is absolutely, utterly sovereign over every subatomic particle holding the subatomic reality, this reality, every atom, every detail, every single everything. Nothing has ever happened that has ever surprised God. He's omniscient. His knowledge is utterly inexhaustible. That is a sovereign God. The free will concept, the suddenly I have free will, now God has to somehow bend my free will so that in free will I would choose against his will because it was with his, not, it's, it's nonsense. When you begin to think through it, it falls apart. So either God is sovereign or he's not. And if he is not sovereign, how do you know your salvation is sure? How do you know that you will stand at his right hand if he is not sovereign? Because if you have free will and you can lose your salvation, then you have to exercise your free will to get saved again. I mean, it's convoluted. It spins around itself and offers no satisfaction to the soul and no assurance. That second hymn, that, or the second chorus, spoke very clearly to that subject. Because a sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is set free. That's it. That's it. Because of what He did, because of the grace He offered, I responded to the mercy, finding myself guilty before a holy God. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies. To me, that's one of the worst. Even denying the sovereign Lord, denying His sovereignty, is an exact representation of what Peter's talking about as a false teacher. And you know, it's satisfying when you begin to understand and reconcile the truly hard things in life. If you've had something horrible happen to you, death, diagnosis, and you trusted in God, that sovereign, powerful, awesome God that never changes, your soul is satisfied. If you were introduced to the destructive heresy that denies the sovereign God and you're not quite sure if he knows everything, he's got everything under control, your soul is wobbly. You're on shifting sand. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them on a cross bringing swift destruction on themselves. Why? Because their house is on sand. There's no rock under their feet. When the storms of life come, they run to whatever's going to satisfy them. Because God isn't enough. Many will follow their depraved conduct. It's another example, another picture of it. They're going to follow their depraved conduct and bring the truth. We can talk a year's worth of sermons about the truth. We'll, we'll, one day we're going to, brother, we, we've got to just go after how, how critical, foundational, absolute is the truth. Jesus is the absolute truth. Okay? Many will follow their depraved conduct and bring the way of truth into disrepute. Do you ever wonder what the way of truth is when you've read this text? What is the way of truth? And the answer is Christ crucified on a cross for sinners. That's the way of truth. It's what lays the soul low that the Lord can build it back up in His might, in His image. That's what He's doing. So, many of these false teachers, many of these false prophets will... Follow those depraved ones' conduct, right? So many 
people will follow the false teacher and the false prophet. Now, if you're following me here, you can see the parallel lines in the Revelation. It, it's staggering. I'm not even going to get into that today. It, it's, it's, it's so intense. But many will follow the depraved conduct in the way of truth and bring the way of truth into disrepute, meaning they're denying the gospel. They're compromising the gospel. It's the gospel and social justice. It's the gospel and love is love. And all the nonsense going on in this culture. They're going to bring the way of truth into disrepute. This is also a picture of what we would call religious pure pluralism. Somehow... You know, John, you shouldn't be saying things like that about them. You sound angry or mean, and you're saying that is not true at all. I, I preface this in the beginning. It is called righteous anger against the enemies of God. If you are, uh, if you're in the pulpit, my soul is now pitiful, gentle, humble, and kind. You stood before people and claim to know the truth, claim to be born of God, and you told them evil things that followed the depraved conduct of man, a curse be on you, the Bible says. May you be destroyed in Korah's rebellion. In their greed, you know what these teachers are going to do? They're going to exploit you with fabricated stories. You know how many fabricated stories are out there? Wokeism in the church. White guilt. Only 84% of Protestants identify as straight. Worldly music and worship. Uh, the church, I watch a church say that autistic people are full of demons. Abortion, not hated in the church. Jesus is still speaking, rainbow flags. From the pulpit, Jesus has been compared to a stripper, a refugee, a woman, or genderless. You need to sow seeds of blessing with your money. Miraculous healings from a man with a white coat. Things that you name it and claim it. The idea that Jesus was politically centrist or not political at all. Prosperity gospels, words of faith. Churches that preach diversity, equity, or inclusion. These are enemies of God. This is depraved conduct. These are exploitations of you because they're getting you charged politically. They're getting you charged socially. The, I, now hear me, there is an outflow, but not before you get to Christ. They put a stumbling block in front of their people by saying things that are wicked about God. In their greed, they are exploiting with fabricated stories. Everything I just mentioned is a fabricated story. The Bible says in the next verse, their condemnation is long hanging over them. And their destruction has not been sleeping. It will come on them as a thief in the night. God is going to destroy them with vengeance. As he did with Korah, he opened the earth and swallowed them. On the day, on the great day, they will be swallowed up. Now we get this piece of scripture I want to unwind because I think oftentimes when we look at scripture it's easy to be bound up in it. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, and, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains to be held for judgment, and if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on the ungodly people who protected Noah. So, this piece of scripture, most people get a little stumbled by it. This is a very important picture. The wicked understand the time of Noah. That the earth, let me read it to you. It comes out of Genesis 6. A very important 
piece of scripture for us to never forget. When you're in a situation and you say these words, I can't believe it happened, I want you to remember me every single time and stop it. And I want you to remember these words. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of man had become on the earth and that every inclination and thought of the human heart was only evil all the time. So when you see something happening and you go, I can't believe it, believe it. When you read the scriptures all the way through, you don't see a reversal of that thought. It doesn't improve. It doesn't change until the Lord Jesus Christ reforms your life by causing you to be born again. When we're dealing with the world, do see, we live in a Christian culture-ish, not so much anymore, but there's this sort of love, goodness, kind of, you know, be good for goodness sake stuff that's going on out there. So a little bit, but as cultures move into America at ferocious rates, they're pushing those concepts out and that's why you probably say these things more and more in your heart because culturally America has been ripped apart politically I believe it's done not on purpose but by utter ignorance in the allowance of all the nonsense of the enemy having his way across this land that this verse, don't hear yourself saying, I can't believe it again. Hear me saying to you that the heart of man is only evil all the time. Genesis 6, 5. <clears throat> Until reformation comes, that is true. That will continue to always be true. And that is why God sent a flood and destroyed everything that breathed on planet earth. As people were clutching to the side of the ark. Help me. God drowned and killed every single one of them for their depravity. This is the picture God paints in this text. He is not joking around. He is serious about it. He is going to... We're going to hear this coming up in chapter 3. He is going to come back with such ferocity... It'll bend your mind when you see it, and you will. So these angels right here are the ones that tempted mankind into that and were perpetually doing so. God saw that their wickedness of what they were, these demons, these fallen angels, was so bad, He put them in hell so that they could not continue that on earth. They're held in judgment right now because those demons acted upon mankind in such a way that, there were, that the earth was so wicked, God had to kill everybody except for Noah, who found favor in his eyes as a preacher of righteousness. And it says this, for if for if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood uh, on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others. These are continual comparisons. You're seeing God's sovereignty to destroy everything that breathes, yet holds a candle. And you ask yourself, why would God do such a thing? Why? And the answer is to get Jesus Christ to earth. All of this is His sovereign will to get you to sit here this morning and hear this sermon. Every step of your life got you to this place by God's sovereign will. And as you are of God, you have been protected like Noah was protected. Think about that for a moment. Think of the millions that perished in Noah's day, but God protected Noah. Think about what I just told you about the millions of people this morning sitting under nonsense. 
rushing their way to hell. But God has protected you. Me. Praise you, Lord. And another picture. If he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes, to make them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. We know everyone's clear what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Homosexuality overran the land. Looking around, you see what's going on? God burned them to ashes as an example of what is going to happen because of their behavior and as an example of what's going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued Lot, this is this protection picture again, a righteous man who is distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless. Brothers and sisters, are your hearts distressed when you open the phone and read the news in the morning? When you see what's going on, when you see these things, when you, when you look around you, is your soul distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless that live around us? I hope so. I hope you see it clearly, that God's given you eyes to understand it. I get it. This love picture, hopefully, these preachings, week after week, are equipping your soul to run into that fire. I get that. That's true. But until you begin to see it right, and us see it right, that the entire world is burning down before us. Because I know what I think. I know what I say. I know what I do. And if, if you are... One one thousandth as wicked as me. You deserve ten million judgments. But if you rescued a lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the brave conduct, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. Are we tormented by what we see? When we look in this world, are we saddened by the false teachers with thousands in the church? Millions of dollars. 40,000 square foot house. Insane. Then Peter says this. If this is so, and it is, then the Lord knows how to rescue. I'm going to rephrase it. Then the Lord knows how to rescue your soul from your trials. And he's going to hold the ones that have persecuted you. The unrighteous. He's going to hold them for trial. He's going to hold them for punishment on the day of judgment. That's what God's going to do. He protects His people. He watches over us. Not one hair of your head can fall to the ground with the will of your Father. You're a child of God Almighty. This is so... And it is. He will protect us. This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the flesh and despise authority. That's a whole sermon right there. Look, the idea that God has set and established authority in every single step, every single place in our life is beautiful. I read a Puritan sermon one time. It was great. They were having a meeting, um, and the commentary is about the meeting. And when they came into the meeting, everyone asked, Who is in charge here? That person was in charge. Good, we're going to listen to you. You sit down and be quiet. I'm here to listen to this one. And I think that's a very, very good way of understanding life. Example. Now, don't get me wrong. It turns sideways on us. We talked a little bit on Wednesday. When, when, when you go into a situation and then suddenly everyone's the chief and everyone wants to tell you what to do, who do I listen to? No authority. See, they despise authority. They don't understand how it's designed to function. Or you're in a situation, everyone's an Indian. No chiefs, no leaders. Now everyone, no one knows what to do. 
You want disorder? You want disorder? You're going to get it. And there you're going to find evil practice, as James would say. You're going to find disorder. You're going to find these troubles of life because there's disobedience to the Word of God. I'll remind you of it. God has established His divine imprint on all social order. Colossians teaches us this. Titus teaches us this. Peter teaches us this. Okay? That when you read the Scriptures, you have the triune God. You have the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And if you read the Bible carefully, the Son 100% obeys the Father perfectly every time, everywhere. That's what makes His life sinless and perfect. Making His sacrifice on that cross infinitely valuable because He perfectly always obeyed His Father. And in doing so, the Father... It's a relationship there. He listens to his Father. And if you read the Bible carefully, you will see the Holy Spirit sent by the Son, sent by the Father, in obedience to both. That's the triune God's order. That's it. That is how God himself defines himself and the economic subordination of God. That's all theological work. What it means is a hierarchy of how things function right in the Godhead. The Son submits to the Father, the Spirit submits to both. Look at the family. The Bible commands the wife to submit to the husband and the children to submit to both. Look at the workplace. The employer is to submit to Christ and the employee is to submit to both. Look at the church. The pastor is to submit to Christ and the congregation is to submit to both. That is God's divine stamp on every piece of social order that's important in your life. He doesn't do it to the government. He doesn't do it. And this is God, those are God's designs. He didn't. He, this is God's design. He was to be our king. It was Israel that rebelled against God and asked for a king. He did not put his divine stamp on political order. Yes, we submit to the political order. I get that. But the divine stamp of God is not in it. It's a very, very critical understanding of how we begin to order our lives in the pattern of God himself. And the Bible commands it. Wives, submit to your husbands and everything. As unto the Lord. Very important point. Um, so that's the part of verse 10, this, this, this despising authority. If you don't have the standard, the hierarchy of authority, then it's easy to despise authority. That's the ignorance part, right? Um, bold and arrogant, they're not uh, afraid to hate to heap abuse on celestial beings. Yet even angels, even though more powerful and stronger, do not heap abuse on such beings when bringing judgment on them from the Lord. So the more powerful and stronger beings aren't acting out capriciously. Again, in this event here. Okay? They're not... They're not a, a, a soldier like at the crucifixion of Christ where they slam the throne of Christ and they, they, you know, they do these things. All they are is obediently walking in the, to, obedient to God, letting Him do the judgment, letting God do the judgment. And the picture for us is, as Paul says, you know, to, allow, to leave room for God's wrath. In these situations of your life, I'll leave room for God's wrath. The more you're given to prayer, the more guiding and living by the Spirit you are, you leave, you leave room for God's wrath. But these people blaspheme in matters they do not understand. Blasphemy abounds. You, you hear it walking through the story. You hear it on the radio. If you listen to any popular radio station, if you're tormented with that, 
at work or something, you hear blasphemies all day long. It's an absolute disgrace. The one that made them is used as a curse word. The people, but these people blaspheme in matters they don't understand. They are like unreasoning animals, creatures of instinct, born only to be caught and destroyed. And like animals, they too will perish. Again, this is this continual judgment on the false prophet, the rebellion of the false teacher. It, it, Peter just goes over and over and over. Now he's going to hammer them. They will be paid back with harm. There will be retribution on the false teacher. This is why I've said this from the pulpit. If God, if you ever had to move or go somewhere, do you ever listen to a anybody, even on the radio? I say, if you do not think they fear God Almighty, do not listen to them. Do not listen to them. It's a very, very foundational point of standing in this pulpit. You must. Live in the fear of God. I know I will be judged. I know I'll be judged severely by God because the Bible tells me in James 3, those who teach will be judged more strictly. I believe that to be true. That's why every word that comes forth must be of the explanation of Scripture. Not, well, it feels good to me. They will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. So, Pastor went through a lot of stuff. I want to get to one more point. I we're running late here. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk about just Balaam for one second, because Balaam is another really important figure in the Scriptures that I think sometimes gets overlooked. Um, it's fascinating. When you look at Balaam, everyone talks. Jesus talks about Balaam. Peter, Paul, Old Testament, all over the place. He's a very interesting prophet. And he's a very important prophet to us. Balaam is a very, very important prophet to us. You might say, well, he's a false prophet. Yes, he is. However, God spoke to Balaam. We know this is true. If you consider the wise men looking for Jesus, right? We know the wise men found Jesus. Why were the wise men looking for a king? And why did they and why did they know when to look? Everyone ever think about that? And the answer comes from two pieces of scripture. One is the prophecy of Balaam in his fourth message that there will be a king coming. And the other one is the prophecy of Daniel of when this king would come. Wise men from the east understood very clearly from Balaam there will be a king and from Daniel when they would come. They looked in the stars and they saw it. And they traveled. And they found Jesus. And they gave him gold, incense, and money. They did, did all those things. It's a very, very good. Balaam is a very important prophet. But Balaam is a trap. Balaam is one that had basically taught, wanted, he still, he said to God, I can't, to Balaam, I can't say anything but what God tells me. And he did. Through all of his prophetic messages. But on the side, Balaam's like, hey, Israel, I've got to get him out of here. He says to him, you know what, dude, this is what you do. Have all your women act like whores. Send them in there, and you'll twist them all up bad. And Balaam's like, all right. And he did. You know what he did? Israel stumbled because of Balaam's error. And through the scriptures, after Moses has him killed, because he was with the Midianites, like 10, 15 chapters later, has him destroyed by the sword, he sets the example of sexual immorality all over the Bible. We're going to add a little caveat in our church constitution that says anybody that is caught in sexual deviant or ungodly behavior it is, it is well we know you're under judgment but if you're in leadership you're immediately expelled. 
You have no business falling into Balaam's ear and thinking you can stand before the people of God. Evil. Pure evil. Part of what Peter taught us is self-control. As we're walking through our life of faith, critical function for any man of God. Keep yourself pure. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to say one more thing. There is so much more to say about this text. Uh, to, but if they have escaped the corruption of this world, verse 20 of by knowing our Lord Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it. This is the parable of the sower. They did not lose their salvation here. Okay, I want to make sure we're clear on that. I used to read this and think people lost their salvation in this text. It doesn't work like that. This is Matthew 12, where the parable of the sower comes out, right? The birds come. They didn't have faith yet. They heard about it. They heard about the way of righteousness. But the bird came and ate it up. The sun scorched it. Or was choked out by the 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 the, the by well by the the, 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 the the cares of the world by chasing after wealth. Right? This is the, this is they, they truly they, they were hearing it, they were moving to it, they were understanding righteousness. That's why we've got to be so careful. You don't assure anyone of faith. They might be on a, on a path where the gospel has plowed the heart and and wise teachers have gone and planted the seed, but only God makes it grow. You confirm your salvation with fear and trembling. I have no ability to peer into your heart. So don't listen to anyone. Oh, you're saved. Oh, you're... That is not true. No man can do that. Ever. Anywhere. Oh, we wish it. That's another story. We want it. That's another story. But I cannot say this. So, it would have been better than not to have known the way of righteousness than to have turned their backs on the sacred commands that they heard. And so of them are true the, pro the proverb that a dog returns to its vomit and a sow that is washed goes back to wallowing in the mud. And if you read chapter 26 of the book of Proverbs, it is a continual theme of foolish behavior and the consequences of folly versus what the righteous do, which is a whole other blessing for the people of God. So, Father in heaven, what a word, what a truth, what a warning, what a privilege, what a mercy we have, Lord, the Lord Jesus, of coming to save sinners like us and sending the Spirit to indwell us. Lord, help us to be protected from the folly of this world and so much false teaching that is all around us, Lord, to be after the pure truth, after the pure word, after true doctrine, Lord, as we stand knit together in the Spirit. Bless your people for your glory as we pray in Jesus' name.